honored to bring Rick Smolin up here from Against All Odds, and he's going to talk about his views on the future of visual communications. Let's give a round of applause for Rick. Thank you, Rick. Come on up. I'm going to do this really quick because I know it's been a long day. I mean, probably the biggest compliment I could give to Evan is I wish this was going to go on for another day because uh, I think everybody's really tired, but I think just getting all these people together and just all the brainstorming and interaction has been fantastic. Um, I don't know how many of you feel this way, but I kind of feel like I have the best job in the world. Um, every year I get to work with my heroes and my peers and some young journalists. and. For the last uh, almost 30 years, I've been, um, in, in, I've been getting to send the people I admire the most in the world out around the world on these sort of crazy Mission Impossible assignments. Uh, I was hired by Time Magazine when I was 26. I was sent to Southeast Asia, and I was about 10 years younger than most of the other photographers. And every time I showed up, everybody's, every, when, people, when, when photographers weren't shooting, they spent most of their time in bars, I found. And uh, most of the photographers that I spent time with would do nothing but sit around and bitch and moan about their editors and their damn magazines and how frustrated and angry they were. And I was 26 years old and I thought someone's actually paying me hundreds of dollars a day to rent Lear jets and meet prime ministers and see the world firsthand. And I, I kept saying, what are you guys complaining about? This is so cool. And the more I talked to these other photographers, the more I realized that every one of them and us wanted our pictures to change the world. And very often when I, we saw our, ma our pictures in the mag magazines, it didn't live up to what our hopes were. I think we all felt very often they were the wrong pictures. The ones that were the most disturbing usually didn't run. Uh, if they didn't illustrate the writer's story, they didn't run. So one day I had this idea. We were sitting around a bar and I said, wouldn't it be cool if we could all get together, just a group of photographers, and go to a country and say, on your mark, it said go, you've got 24 hours. So all my much older, wiser friends said, what a cool idea. You go organize it and tell us when it's ready and we'll all come, thinking that would be the end of it. So I met with 35 publishers around the world, and I pitched them on this idea of the best photographers in the world all going to Australia, where I was living at the time. And they all said, what a stupid idea. Like, nobody would ever buy a book like this, and who would care about a bunch of your friends having a party in Australia for a day? So I went to the Prime Minister of Australia thinking he might pay for it. Uh, and I tried. I actually asked him to pay for it. And he said, nice idea. He said, but I will help you. I can't give you money, but I'll help you. And boy, did he give me an idea. He said, I'm going to introduce you to the CEOs of Fortune 500 companies, like the, the CEO of Qantas, the CEO of Kodak Australia. He introduced me to Steve Jobs. And I said, why do I want to talk to some computer guy? This is 1980. Um, and he said, you're going to ask them for computers and hotel rooms and airline tickets. And I said, they're just going to give you this stuff for free? And he said, yes, because you're going to put their logo in your book. And I said, I can't do that. That would be immoral and selling out. And he said, Rick, Rick, it's like a PBS documentary. In any case, um, we did these. Uh, we did the Day in the Life of Australia book. It was self-published. We couldn't find a publisher. Um, it became the number one book in the country with no publisher, no bookstore distribution. We sold it through newspapers. And I thought I'd go back to being a photographer. But it was so successful that I, I actually never went back to really shooting after that. Um, we did a whole series of books. We sold about 5 million copies of these books in a market where 5,000 was a bestseller. Um, I started thinking, what if you took that same idea, took a group of really talented writers, photographers, illustrators, animators, and not just did a book, but did a book, a TV show, uh, website, apps, exhibits, and massive global publicity. And if, if we looked at emerging topics, like what if we could take our group of journalists and actually help explain things that were just starting to emerge into the public awareness, like the internet, like the microprocessor, like the global water crisis. Or more recently, we did a book about the world of big data. Something that I didn't understand at all, because I feel like I backed all into all this completely by accident, was that if you invite photographers representing Time and Newsweek and Life and Fortune and Epica and OG and the London Sunday Times, they all go back to their publications and say, I just worked on this amazing project. We've got to do a big story about it. So to my astonishment, after being turned down by everybody in the publishing community, the book community, um, we suddenly had Time and Newsweek like furious because we were giving the, the pictures to one or the other. Like they were angry at us because, well, why did you give that to Time? We would have done a cover story on it. We've had hundreds of cover stories around the world every time we've done one of these projects. This is the sort of died and gone to heaven moment in publishing. I found my next favorite thing one day when I was just going through the bookstore. One of my favorite things to do is to go to the bookstore. Y'all heard? Okay. So I found this book. It is a great gift. It's called America 24-7. It is uh, from New York Times, the number one best-selling authors, Rick. Anyway, I just wanted to show that because it doesn't get any better than that in publishing. I mean, you, it just, nothing will ever reach what Oprah does. 
Um, we, uh, I've always been sort of a technology junkie, as Evan remembers, even from our early days of working together. And one of the ideas that we had was to actually do uh, massive books where we not only in invited professional photographers, but we opened it up to the public as well. And then a young guy on our staff uh, named Josh Hayner, who won the Pulitzer Prize three weeks ago, uh, Josh started interning for us when he was 15 years old. Uh, when he was 21, um, he graduated at the top of his class at Stanford. And when he was 26, he came to work with us, with us on a project called America 24-7. And he, one day he walked in my office and said, do you have a picture of your daughter, who was three at the time? And I said, yeah, and I gave it to him. And the next day he walked in and he had a replacement dust jacket for a day in the life of, for America 24-7 that looked exactly like the bookstore version, but it was my daughter on the cover. And he said, I wrote the software, I found the vendors. Um, I, basically, we can deliver these for $6 each. And that's why Oprah actually put us on the show because it was the first time there was a New York Times bestseller where every single copy of the book was different for each individual user. This was my daughter when she was three. It just sort of shows you how the customization works. So we've, you know, I think one of the things that Brian was talking about before is basically being the master of your own fate and, and doing your own distribution. When I sell a $50 book through a publisher, I make $1.50. I mean, it's obscene. I mean, how does anybody make a living in this business? If you self-publish, you make a lot more, but you also could be stuck with a warehouse full of books, and not all of our books have been hugely successful. So it's really a, it's a very scary proposition to be out there, and in Brian's case, he put up all the money for the long night, and now he's got to find a way. It's not just to get the money back. You want an audience. That's why all of us, everybody in this room, wants to create things and wants to, to, ha to affect people and, and touch them and, and move them in some way. Um, we have done many other projects where we've been, again, co combining professional photography together with crowdsourced. We've had literally millions of people sending us photographs along the way. And when we did this project, uh, IKEA came to us. And, and I've told companies over and over again, we don't do annual reports. We're a group of journalists. When a company sponsors one of our books, they get no right of editorial review. They have no input. We don't put, we, the one thing I tell the sponsors, we will leave your products out of the book. We'll put your comp competition in the book. We'll never feature uh, companies' products in our books because the moment you do that, you lose all your credibility. So when we do these projects, again, the media sort of goes crazy over them. Um, I was incredibly shy when I was a kid, and one of the things these projects have been really good is sort of teaching me sort of how to, how to try to get other people excited about the projects themselves. Um, I'll show you two other things very quickly and then talk a little bit about what I see as sort of going on to the future. When uh, Obama uh, won the presidency the first time, I was talking to David Burnett and a bunch of my other friends in the media, in the photography community, and I started realizing that all of my friends, so many of my friends have been on the campaign trail with the candidates, and I said, you know, do you have pictures, great pictures that weren't published? And uh, I got 40,000 pictures from friends that basically were pictures that no one had seen because it didn't fit that day's news cycle. So I went to Hewlett Packard, who, had, who has uh, the technology that powers uh, the blur books, and I said, what if we try to aim to see if we could do the, ma the first best-selling mass customized uh, print-on-demand book, where not just the cover of the book, but throughout the book, um, the pictures inside would change, that your children's artwork would appear next to a page of other children's artwork. Your name would be inscribed on the invitation to attend Obama's inauguration. Your picture would be next to Oprah Winfrey inside the book in a way that's completely integrated um, so I'll show you two videos that we did. So I got this it. cool new book. It's called The Obama Time Capsule, and it captures Obama's inspiring journey to the White House. What's really unique is that you can personalize the book in eight ways. For example, you can add pictures of your family to a page of key Obama supporters. So once they're up there, you just resize and crop them. There's even a couple of spots where you can put in your own name and text. Here, let me dedicate The Obama Time Capsule to my mom. She's a big Obama supporter. When you're done customizing it, it usually takes about 10 days to get it in the mail. Check this out. Now you're the co-author and your family's included in the book, side by side with these awesome photos of Obama's journey and even stats from the election. This part's also amazing. Your name appears inscribed on your own personal invitation to attend Obama's inauguration. And your photo appears next to some famous Obama supporters. And the coolest thing about the book is that you get to become part of his story. These guys are just unbelievable. And again, it speaks to how much these tools have now become so easy for people to use. They basically took a series of ads that HP had been doing and copied the process. But I mean, it was just beautifully done. Um, one other ad that we had a group of other friends do. You were there. You were there to hear the message of hope. You were there at the beginning and for the victory and every step of the way. 
with your time, your support, your dreams, your passion, and to see history in the making. Now you can add yourself and your family to the pages of history in the Obama time capsule, a book as unique as the events it commemorates. Every copy individualized because it's your story too. He couldn't have done it without you. Again, this is, we got a group of friends. Adobe gave us our studio for an afternoon. This was done in three days. It's just astounding now that these tools exist. That things like, you know, TouchCast that Eric was showing a few minutes ago. It's amazing that now you have a broadcast network in our studio in your pocket. Um, I'll show you our most recent project. Uh, we, uh, I go to TED every year, and Marissa Meyer, who's a really good friend, who's helped us when she was at Google and now she's at Yahoo, she said, you know, you should do a book about big data. I said, what's that? And she said, a lot of us believe we're watching the planet develop a nervous system. This was by far the most difficult project we've ever done. And I'll show you a little bit of what it's about. What we've been trying to do in each of these is use, is use showcase photographers and their work to put a human connection to technology starting to transform our lives. So we sent 100 photographers to 30 countries uh, for about a month. Uh, not all, they didn't go for a month, but they, over the course of a month. And here's a little video sort of explaining the project. In the near future, every object on Earth will be generating data, including our homes, our cars, and yes, even our bodies. It's easy to feel overwhelmed by the amount of data we're exposed to. Our 15th century counterparts experienced less data in their entire lifetime than we do in a single day. Our smart devices are turning each of us into human sensors. We now leave a trail of digital exhaust, a perpetual stream of texts, location data, and other information that will live on forever. But who owns the data we generate? Who profits from it? And why are governments and corporations the only ones thinking about the impact of big data? In glorious photographs and moving essays, the human face of big data is the story of how our planet is beginning to develop a nervous system, one that each of us is part of. The human face of big data captures an extraordinary revolution sweeping almost invisibly through every facet of our daily lives. If you thought the internet changed the world, just wait till you see what big data has in store for us. That was sort of the point of all this, is my big concern here is that it's governments and corporations that are spending a lot of time thinking about big data and how powerful it is, but most of us are not really thinking about it, and I think it's something that's going to change our lives much more dramatically than and even the internet, and the internet's obviously done an amazing job in the last 20 years. Um, I'm going to show you two more things, and then I'm going to sort of answer Evan's question about what's coming up next. Um, I've been working with the uh, producers of the King's Speech on a feature film that's coming out in December, uh, actually September, uh, about a story I shot originally for National Geographic when I was 28 years old. It's something that's been in development for many years, and let me see if I can make this work. This has been 30 years in the making. It was Diane Keaton for, tried it yes, first, sir. then Julia Roberts. I am planning to walk across the Australian desert from Alice Springs to the Indian Ocean, a distance of 2,000 miles. And when people ask me why I'm doing it, my usual answer is, why not? Your plan is ridiculous. You must be mad, girly. You know, that's about 2,000 miles. Six months of hard walking. You want to die out there or something?
So a lot of you have been hearing, hearing obviously about Getty Images and their decision to make all of their pictures free. And probably like a lot of you, I was pretty concerned when I heard this because it sounded like a horrible idea. I mean, as if where we as photographers aren't getting screwed <laughs> already and, and as if prices haven't been plummeting because of uh, the whole stock photography and iStock photo market and this sort of, um, it, it feels like our photographs have become, you know, sort of com commoditized in a way that's, sorry, I'm sorry, I'm talking to myself here. Um, in any case, I actually was uh, fortunate enough to meet with Jonathan uh, Kaplan from, uh, sorry, Jonathan Klein from Getty Images, and I said, so what's the deal here? You're giving all these pictures away for free, so the photographers get nothing out of this. I understand that you're putting a player, you're embedding this player on people's websites and that you're going to be able to run advertising. And to my relief and, and great pleasure, what he told me is that they're going to be sharing the revenues. They're giving the photographers the exact same rev share as they do with their photographs now, which is actually pretty remarkable. And it's something, I don't know if Giddy had to do it, but um, I, I was excited about that. Um, you know, Brian's wife, Elodie, works at Getty, and I talked to her a lot about this when this first uh, was first announced. And it's actually a really clever idea. They're going to give, basically, imagine for the first two years, Getty allows people to uh, embed their photographs on websites, hundreds of millions, billions of websites around the world. And then one day they can turn on advertising, and they actually know enough about the people coming to those websites that they can have advertising that's actually appropriate. So it's actually something people would enjoy because they're going to those websites for, for, that, for that particular reason. So a couple of thoughts here. This idea that um, content now doesn't exist, but you can turn it on and off, that you can buy an app on your iPhone, but that Apple can actually r remove the app from your iPhone. Think about your photographs being embedded throughout the internet, but Getty can decide whether to turn on or off those pictures. So it's sort of a really interesting conundrum in a way because people are not buying the photographs, they're kind of licensing them. You remember in the early days of the internet, some of you remember this, but 300 baud modems and the, the, uh, the, um, the, the Radio Shack Model 100, if you had told people back then that someday the internet would be ubiquitous to the point where it was on all the time, everywhere you went you could access the internet, you wouldn't, you wouldn't dial in, it would simply be around you. People wouldn't believe it. So I've been thinking what other technologies are out there that right now seem completely wondrous that may also be commoditized in the future. So when Neil Armstrong landed on the moon, the technology that was required to get him to the moon, I've been told, uh, now basically is, is in, you know, incorporated into uh, you know, postcards and greeting cards. And it's disposable. We throw these things away. Um, so I started thinking, where is all this going? Like right now we're looking at Google Glass. The police department in New Orleans is using, they, as of a week ago, all the police in uh, New Orleans are now starting to wear cameras all the time. So every interaction they have with the public is being recorded to protect uh, the public and also to, to have the police be able to say what actually happened in different events. But um, you know, we were talking before about the dronies and about this new idea of having your picture taken uh, you know, everywhere you are. Uh, the Oculus Rift that Facebook just bought for $2 billion. Think about when you combine the Oculus Rift with a drone. Um, and then I started thinking about um, this idea of what if, what if we get to the point where we're basically, there are insects where we can actually, if any of you have read this book, uh, Diamond Age by Neil Stevenson, if you haven't, this is just a fantastic book. We talks about a time in the future where they're literally it's in the dust, there's cameras everywhere you go, where everything's being recorded constantly 24 hours a day. Um, th those were just some of the thoughts that I wanted to share. I know I've gone way over my time. I just wanted to say thank you again to Evan, and uh, just to say how much I enjoyed being with all of you today. Thank you. That was fantastic. Thank you very much. <laughs>